Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the Big Fat Purse show. Today we have Evan Blaker from the NetNet Hunter. And I first came across NetNet Hunter through uh, Old School Value. I was reading through his articles and came across um, an article from Evan actually. And I read it with a lot of interest because uh, it resonated with the style of investing that uh, I do myself. So I'm, I'm, I went over to his site and oh man, I was amazed by the amount of content uh, that he actually have. And it's really very quality stuff and there are not a lot of uh, websites that talk about uh, Benjamin Graham style investing and it was like a gem in the ocean of a lot of uh, other rubbish sites so um, I I persuaded my uh, business partners that we must uh, sign up for Nanet Hunter subscription and eventually we did so and inside the membership we found even more gems uh, Evan talked about stocks he analyzed the Nanet stocks uh, in detail and this is not just in a, a particular country in the US which most sites cover he also went into UK Japan uh, all these countries with uncovering all these Nanet stocks so uh, we are very very honored to have Evan today with us so uh, maybe we'll start a little bit uh, way back to in time to talk a little bit. How do you even get started in investing in the first place? <laughs> well, first of all, thanks for the intro. I'm going to have to get you as a website spokesperson, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, just getting to the question. Um, after I graduated high school, I fell in love. Um, actually, I was in love with a beautiful red Jeep TJ. Uh, but uh, the problem is I didn't have any money, so I couldn't buy the TJ. So I ended up getting a job, and uh, my uncle got me this job. It was at a local shipyard, and it turned out to be just brutal. I spent 40 hours um, a week sweeping the shop floor, carrying large pieces of plywood up the shop stairs, and the air in the shop was just filled with fiberglass dust. So I don't know if you've ever worked with fiberglass, but uh, it's brutal stuff. We were wearing full coveralls. I had a respirator, but still uh, the fiberglass would get through the respirator, through, oh. through the coveralls, okay. and it would just embed into your skin. So anyways, at the, at the end of the year, I'd earned enough money to buy this TJ. And uh, I should have been ecstatic, but you know, I looked at my bank account and I thought back to all the pain and suffering I've been through to earn that much money, and it just wasn't worth it. So I knew that uh, I had to put the money to work for me. Okay, I see. So it was. Yeah. It, you found that work was tough, and there's a better way of doing things, right? Okay. Yeah. And and how do you get started to learn about investing? How? Because I guess for every beginner, is there, there's a lot of resources out there, but um, it's a lot unguided uh, way of learning. How do you get find a way to eventually um, get into this net net investing? Well, for people just starting out, uh, I think you're right. Um, there is a lot of sources of information out there. Um, unfortunately, I think that there's also a lot of misinformation out there. Um, Actually, I'm, I read your site's mandate, uh, and I spent some time on your site um, Thank you. a few weeks ago, and um, I'm pretty happy with what you're trying to do over there. Um, but for me, if I'm instructing uh, a new investor, somebody who's just coming to investing now, I would basically tell them to learn from the greats and read as much as possible. Uh, there really, there's no substitute and there's no excuse for not reading um, the great investors, Benjamin Graham. Warren Buffett, you know, Charles Munger, Seth Klarman, people like that. Um, for me, you know how I came to investing. Um, and I ended up with uh, the net net stock strategy. Um, but I came about it or I came to it in a very roundabout way. You know, when I first when I first started learning about investing, I read about something called, you know, Benjamin Graham's net net stocks. And I was pretty impressed by the returns on offer. Um, but when I started reading articles, uh, the articles were saying that these stocks are a relic of the past. They're just not available in the modern markets anymore. And so that sent me off course for about six or seven years. Um, I fumbled my way through a whole host of different investing strategies, 
I had a really rocky time. I, things just were not clicking for me. So in about, you know, after about six or seven years of uh, really stumbling through investing, by chance, I happened upon uh, an art, or a, a, I think it was a blog that somebody set up and they were actively investing in net stocks. So I thought, you know, what is this? You know, obviously if this guy's doing it, then these stocks are still available. Um, which means I could invest in NNS stocks. And so I just dove, you know, headfirst into it. Um, started reading a lot more Graham. Uh, I read a lot of the in academic and industry white papers that were available on NNS stocks. And so, yeah, that's basically how I got into it. I see. And we also understand that um, NNS stocks are usually uh, involves the ugly stocks, right? Uh, uh, stocks with, you know, uh, problems here and there. And yeah. how, how do you get the confidence to even consider buying them? Because I guess it's always very hard for an investor to do something that's very uncomfortable. Well, I think it was John Templeton that said that if you want to beat the market, then you have to do something that's different from the crowd. Um, a lot of people just don't have the emotional temperaments and emotional intelligence needed to buy these stocks. Um, that's unfortunate. Uh, but when you're looking at these companies, you're right, a lot of them look terrible. Um, the typical net net stock uh, is a stock of a company that was humming along, doing fairly well until you know a major crisis hit. And as a consequence, um, revenue you know just fell off a cl cliff. It's, it's not uncommon to see these companies drop in revenue by you know anywhere from 60 to 80 percent. You know that's very normal. Um, and the stock price obviously follows and you know stock prices it's not uncommon to see those crater by 90 percent so yeah they're very very scary stocks but what you have to do is you have to first of all read the research that's been done on these stocks um understand um understand how net net stock investing works and then just trust people like you know benjamin graham Warren Buffett, Walter Schloss, who all invested in net nets, um, and just trust what um, that what they're saying about the strategy is actually true. Okay. okay, and we have been talking about net net using the term um, profusely, right? Um, yeah. Would you explain <laughs> uh, to to the viewers what what is a net net stock? What what is a particular characteristic of a net net stock? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm going to assume that most people watching this know what a low price to book value stock is. Um, so a net net stock is really just a low price to book value stock, but where we totally exclude long term assets. So in other words, we're just taking the current assets and we're subtracting all liabilities, all off balance sheet liabilities such as um, uh, unfunded pension liabilities. Uh, we're subtracting also the face value of the preferred stocks and what you end up with is an amount that we call the net current asset value and so the idea is that we're buying below that value so when a stock the stock is trading below the net current asset value then we would call that a net net stock okay and there are people with that believe that cheap stocks can go cheaper right and people fear the, the concept of a value trap. How do you ha increase your chances that uh, these net net stocks are unlikely to turn out to be value traps? Okay, well, um, I think you have like two concepts there that need to be separated. First one is stocks going lower. Second one is value traps. Um, I don't consider it a big problem if the stock goes lower after I buy it. Um, I know that a lot of people think differently about that, but from what I've read, a lot of the pros, uh, like the really, really gifted investors, uh, and again, I'm referring to you know the old school Benjamin Graham, Warren Buffett style investors, um, they tend to not really care if a stock goes lower after they buy it because they know that they can't pick the bottom. Um, in terms of avoiding value traps, I think the single best way to avoid a value trap is to buy high quality net net stocks. So what I like to do with my own portfolio as much as possible is I look for stocks that are growing, um, growing net profit, uh, normalized net profit, um, net current asset value, 
by roughly 10% or more per year. And I like to look at uh, companies that have uh, a PE of less than 10. Um, so the PE comes from actually a study that Joel Greenblatt did. Um, so I essentially look for those type of companies. And I find that if you stick with those type of high quality companies, uh, you tend to avoid value traps. Those stocks tend to always work out really well. Okay. So you have additional um, indicators to complement the uh, original net net principles in order to enhance your probability of uh, getting a right stock. That's exactly it. Okay. Yeah, that's it. That's really what it comes down to. Right. Um, you know, right now I think we have something like four hundred net net stocks um, on our stock list in Net Net Hunter, but really what I do is I use a range of criteria and I whittle that down to roughly 30, 30 of the best quality picks. And then out of that, I'm very selective and um, I do even more screening based on um, a couple of different scorecards that I've developed. One is called the Core 7 scorecard. I know you're yeah. familiar with it. That's right. Um, so I use characteristics on that scorecard to um, refine the list even further to get to the highest uh, quality stocks available. Okay. You're saying that you are pretty selective on the stock. So is there a number that you keep within uh, for your portfolio size? Yeah, um, for me, uh, because I can, the thing about diversification is that, uh, you know, the, the smaller your portfolio, the fewer positions that you have in it, the more you uh, the more volatility you're going to see, right? The more positions that you have in it, the less volatility that you're going to see. Now, I'm somebody who has um, thankfully developed a lot of uh, emotional intelligence and a fairly strong temperament, so I can handle a lot of volatility. So I tend to go with roughly ten stocks in my portfolio. Now, that wouldn't work for everybody. Um, but again, I can stomach the volatility that comes along with that. If you're new to net net stocks, um, if you're new to mechanical investing, then I would suggest roughly 20. Uh, I think 20 is a good number. I wouldn't start going more than 20 because then you really start to sacrifice quality uh, in favor of diversification. And um, yeah, it's always a balance between the two. I see. Okay. Yeah. And there was, there's also another concern that uh, if one has too many stocks, um, you know, you will require a lot of uh, maintenance work. You need to keep up with the stocks. Um, what was the effort like if, when you monitor a portfolio of net net stocks? Um, for mine, yeah, I mean, it really comes down to how many positions you have. Uh, for mine, I have 10. Uh, so I don't actually spend a lot of time monitoring it. I don't look at stock prices that often, or I try not to anyways. Um, I would say that my turnaround in a given year is maybe, you know, a third, 33%. Um, so I just, uh, if we're talking about one particular stock, I just, I, I do the analysis on it. I buy it when it's a good value. And then I just wait for the quarterly results to come in or uh, half year results, depending on where you're investing. And I just uh, reassess the numbers and then I just wait. Um, and eventually, uh, chances are it's going to pop back up to net current asset value and then I sell. Yeah. Right. So, so it's more like a quarterly affair. Uh, it's not daily, it's not even every minute, not even every seconds. Yeah, I mean, you. Uh, I think it's good to monitor the news that comes out about a stock, um, but a lot of it is noise. So um, the thing you'd have to be very selective about the things you pay attention to. Um, you know, as a as a long term investor, we're always fighting against market noise, right? So I would look at things like the company is going to spend its cash on buying, you know, an acquisition, and I would I would note that as a red flag and I would uh, really think hard about possibly getting rid of the company. Or I would look at situations where the company has just been, had an offer made uh, by a third party to acquire the entire company. And in that case, if the company jumps up to, net, to the purchase price or above, then I would seriously consider selling. I see. So uh, you mentioned a little bit how you actually trim those uh, net net stocks that you realize that you were mistakes. And you also mentioned that um, if they go to a certain price, you would sell. So is mm. there a particular target profit that you always look for in for your net net stocks? 
Um, the target price of that I normally look for is just the net current asset value. So one of the things that you'll find when you review the studies is that the companies that show the deepest discount to net current asset value tend to perform better than the rest. Uh, so I tend to buy companies as cheaply as possible. Um, it really helps that I'm a cheap guy. So <laughs> just kind of fits. Um, but after I purchase, um, yeah, I just wait for it to bounce up to net current asset value. Uh, and I'm looking for as big a spread as possible. Now, you know, the nice thing about buying high quality net net stocks is that uh, often they'll be increasing in net current asset value. So while you're sitting back waiting, uh, your profit potential and your margin of safety is potentially growing. Mm -hmm. Especially when the company has retained earnings, so the net current asset value will grow over time. So your exactly. potential target will go up as well. Okay. Exactly, exactly. Um, and I guess a lot of investors are, are very impatient nowadays. They will always mm -hmm. ask, um, how long must I wait for the net net stock to realize <laughs> its value, right? What, what is the yeah, typical time sure. frame that uh, uh, an investor should expect? Well, as part of my, uh, as part of my study of net net stocks, uh, when I was really diving into the strategy, I read through and I assessed all of uh, Warren Buffett's partnership letters uh, in detail. And in one of them, he says that net net stocks tend to work out roughly 75% of the time or 80% of the time uh, within two years. So that's the that's the kind of um, you know, those are the kind of trends that I would be looking for. I see. Two years is yeah. a fair enough time, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I think so. <laughs> but you know, to I mean, nowadays, to a lot of people, that's a very very long time. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, a lot of people like to get in and out of stocks within months. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's, it's not something I can fathom. But yeah. they wanted to get rich yesterday. Two days too late. Yeah, I know. <laughs> It's an eye, but you know it doesn't work that way. <laughs> yeah. So out of so many um, countries uh, that you analyze the net net stocks, um, is there a particular country that uh, offers a lot more opportunity at this point in time? Especially you know recently um, the market has uh, corrected a bit. So are there any interesting places that investors should be looking at? Yes, definitely Japan. Uh, definitely Japan. Um, you know, I find when I talk to uh, people that subscribe to our free newsletter, uh, those a lot of people um, don't want to invest outside of the U.S. and that's really sad because there are a lot of opportunities outside the U.S. Right now, most members, um, most Net Net Hunter members, are finding the best opportunities in Japan. Um, Really, if you want to invest in high quality net net stocks, you should look internationally and Japan definitely has the best stocks on offer right now. Okay. okay. Um, do you particularly diversify your portfolio of 10 stocks into different countries? Is there a deliberate um, quantity that you stick to or it's wherever the opportunity just presents itself? Um, I don't diversify based on country, uh, but I could very well be wrong in that. So I'm open to be, you know, the fact that I could be wrong in that strategy. But my thought is that um, I might as well buy the best quality holdings because I don't know what's going to happen to overall market, right? I don't know what's going to happen to a country's situation. Um, there's, a, you know, thousands of really smart economists and analysts that are trying to figure out that out and they don't have a good track record so you know what's the hope that I'm going to be able to tell what a company's or a country is going to do um, going forward so I I do exercise uh, control over the things that I know I do have control over and that really comes down to just picking high quality net net stocks mm -hmm. so yeah in short no I don't I don't worry about what company or country I'm investing in or whether I'm over overexposed to a certain country I see uh, besides country, uh, what about industry? Would you be concerned if, let's say, 10 stocks are all in a particular sector or industry? Would that be a little bit um, more s susceptible to the unsystematic risk? Um, I'm going to answer this question a little bit different way. I find that there's really two areas that uh, net-net stock investors should avoid. Uh, the first one is China. 
and the second one is resource and specifically resource exploration companies. Um, you know, with the TSX down something like 75% over the last couple of years, there's a lot of resource companies out there. Uh, but the problem with resource companies is that um, a company will spend, if it's an exploration company, it'll spend basically its entire life acquiring capital from shareholders and then pissing it away trying to find resources. And uh, I knew somebody who um, is a mining engineer uh, and he travels all around the world um, helping mines extract uh, minerals and you know do assessments and all that. And he says that roughly one to two percent of uh, resource expor exploration companies actually find something. The rest never do. So if you're buying resource exploration net nets, chances are the net current asset value of the company is just going to be um, you know spent uh, the longer you hold it. So I stay away from those. Uh, I stay away from those uh, companies. Um, I also stay away from China and Chinese net nets. Um, there's a great uh, auditor, I think it's an auditor, um, their name is Muddy Waters Research. I'm not sure if you've heard of them. Yep, definitely, because they were slamming one of the Singapore stocks here. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not going to touch Singapore, but... Um, yeah, I mean, they dove into China, and uh, I think the Chinese have a proverb, or at least according to Muddy Waters research, the Chinese have a problem, proverb. And the proverb is, um, when the water is muddy, many fish can be caught. Uh, you know, I'm probably saying that a little bit wrong, but, um, you know, there's a lot of misinformation when it comes to Chinese stocks, and there's a lot of uh, reverse merger scams that have taken place over the years. Um, the auditors uh, are just doing a horrible job in the West of auditing the company's actual assets uh, when the company is based in China. So when I'm looking at a net net, I, I really want to make sure that um, when I'm looking at the numbers, uh, it's just not like smoke and mirrors, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So for that reason, I, I avoid China. I see. It's the same experience here in Singapore. Um, we have a lot of Chinese companies coming to Singapore to list. And over the years, almost every year, there are fraud cases being, being um, uncovered. And I guess investors have really lost confidence in the corporate governance, the integrity of the management in this Chinese company. So yeah, we, we basically stay away from those as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's really sad. You can, you can look on the net and you can find, um, you know, Chinese net net stocks and they're dirt cheap and you're like looking at this company, you're like, wow, it's amazing. It's growing at 20% a year, has no debt. You know, I mean, why is this company priced at, you know, 10% of book value? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, it's all smoke and mirrors. It just doesn't exist. Yeah. yeah. Um, besides the two um, caution that you give for net net investors, um, what other uh, problems do you foresee investors um, investing using the net net strategy? Are there any things that they should watch out for other than these two areas that you just mentioned? Um, yeah, I think first of all, watch where you're getting your information from. Um, there's a lot of articles about net net stocks um, that I've read and I just called BS on them. Um, there is one by, I won't mention the name, but uh, they were talking about Radio Shack and because Radio Shack was unprofitable, they went bankrupt. Not the case at all. Radio Shack had a debt to equity uh, ratio of something like 400%, oh, okay. which is the real reason that they went bankrupt. Um, so, so I would be very careful about where you're getting your information from. Um, again, it goes back to um, researching the greats, um, reading through the actual academic and uh, white papers that have been done on net nets to get to actual facts. Um, and then also, uh, I very, very strongly recommend that investors stay away from companies that um, have too high of a debt to equity ratio. Uh, companies that are burning through net current assets um, at a fast rate. I think those are two really, really um, key types of stocks to stay away from. I see. You, you mentioned about um, high debt to equity stocks should be uh, watchful about. Um, is there mm -hmm. a number that you can share with us that you would determine that this company is 
too high in terms of their debt levels? Sure. Um, I guess, you know, where you draw the line is kind of arbitrary. Um, but I believe that Graham, um, actually maybe Graham had a higher uh, standard, but I tend to look for a company that has a debt to equity ratio of no more than 50%. So I don't want um, debt to equity ratios that are higher than 50%. And it doesn't mean that I'll invest in companies that have a debt to equity below that 50%. Uh, because I have a even stronger standard for my own portfolio. Mm. I tend to focus on companies that um, really have tiny debt to equity ratios. Either they have no debt at all, which is ideal, okay. or they have debt to equity ratios below say um, 20 or 25 percent. Mm -hmm. Tweedy Brown actually published um, a great paper and it's available on the web for free. You should download it right now. Yeah. Um, it's called, uh, I think it's called the 10 things um, or 10 ways to beat an index um, or what's it called how did it work uh, in investing pardon me I, I i think i came across one of the how it how it worked in invest what works in investing if i'm not wrong. yeah There's that's another, the one there we go yeah, <laughs> yeah, my mind. Too. Yeah. <laughs> oh good good um they have one section where they look at low price to book value stocks and included in that are net net stocks uh, and they have Another one that takes the same group of stocks, but just eliminates all the ones that have a debt to equity ratio above, say, 20 or 25 percent. And um, you can actually uh, improve your results by something like 5 percent uh, per year on average if you just exclude debt. So, yeah, that's what I try to do. That, that's a very large uh, difference in terms of the performance. 5 percent a year yeah. compounded, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's huge, huge, huge. Okay. Um, speaking of which, uh, about net net stocks, uh, because net net stocks essentially look at companies with assets. What about companies with very little assets, like tech companies? Um, they would never have a chance to qualify as a net net stock, right? Well, I think they would, but um, you know, again, it comes down to what the price of the stock is. So, even if a company has very little in terms of assets, if it has very even less in terms of liabilities. And then the stock price is, you know, you know, tiny, razor thin. Then, uh, then it can qualify as a net net. Okay. Yeah. So I don't think that um, you know, excluding uh, aside from you know, resource companies, I don't think that excluding it, and possibly pharma, um, I don't think that really is worthwhile excluding any industry. Yeah. But uh, if you look at something like Apple. Um, I don't think that's going to be a net net anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, and we understand that investing is a lot about psychology of the investor, right? And yeah. um, what are the potential challenges that an investor would face if he or she uses the net net investing strategy? Well, you know, there's a couple that I'm always subject to. I feel the polls. I don't think that anybody is really um, immune to um, you know these psychological hang-ups that you get in the market or you know emotional um, decision making. Everybody feels that pull, and two that I feel the strongest, but thankfully I'm aware of, are price anchoring um, and uh, probably also large drops. So if I see a large drop. Uh, in one of my stocks, even though the fundamentals are sound uh, and nothing's really changed in the stock story, I feel a little pang there. Um, but I've gotten better over the last few years of um, seeing that pang for what it is and kind of doubling down where appropriate. Um, same with price anchoring. You know, sometimes um, you have a stock and the stock really hasn't worked out and you realize it hasn't worked out and it's probably not going to work out the probabilities are now against you um, profiting from the stock but you bought it at say you know a hundred and the stock is now down to 80 but you're thinking you know if i could just get a hundred for it or or even like 95 that's fine but the price you originally paid for the stock has absolutely no bearing on where the stock's going to go in the future or um, what type of decisions appropriate for you now, right? So that's another thing to be aware of. I see. Okay. Um, are you an oddball among your friends in the sense that uh, 
<laughs> you are the you are the one that invests your money while most of your friends they don't even really care about their own finances. Um, I think I've been a contrarian my entire life. I prefer a contrarian to oddball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And among your right. investing friends, how many of them are actually using uh, net net uh, strategy equivalent? Um, actually, of the people that uh, that are investing, I would say that I've gotten about half of them to start investing. And the, the other half, um, take a value approach, but one of my friends, he's a macro investor and uh, he's doing something that's incredibly hard. I mean, he's, he's a bright guy, but it's still incredibly hard. Um, and I know another guy who works for KPMG um, by the name of Scott Robertson, and uh, he's very intelligent. And he originally started with uh, Warren Buffett type stocks, but he started to branch out into net nets more. That's great. That's great. Okay. Yeah. So it's more of you convincing the other camps to join you rather than the other the others trying to convince you, right? Yeah, pretty much. I'm I'm a bit hard headed. I don't think that I'm <laughs> <convinced>, so. <laughs> I remember I read that that was what Warren Buffett wrote about Walter Schloss. He said that yeah. he, he's just stubborn. He just continues to do what he do. He, he doesn't really care about what others say, right? So I guess yeah. being, being a net net investor, you would need that kind of stubbornness. That tinge of stubbornness is actually good. Right. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, you have to you have to be comfortable going against the crowd. Um, you have to be comfortable with who you are. Um, you know, with your own conclusions, uh, and you just have to trust the evidence. I mean, when you buy net nets you're buying because most of the crowd does not uh, agree with you, right? Yeah. You're fundamentally a contrarian at that point. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, would you like to share a little bit more about the Nanette Hunter membership? Yeah, sure. Um, right now we have two membership tiers. We have a monthly tier and we have a yearly tier. And the monthly tier is 125 a month and the yearly tier works out to, I think, 42 a month. Um, but what we have available is we have um, our raw list of stocks, raw list of net nets, and like I said, there's roughly 400 of those available. And then we also have um, our stock short list, and we've whittled those down to about 30, 30 of the 400. Um, on top of that, we have a resource center uh, that you were talking about earlier. Um, and in that resource center, you can find a lot of articles that explain what we do in detail. Um, and then we also have an uh, inner circle forum. And our inner circle forum is where a lot of the really interesting discussions take place on net net stocks. Uh, we're always talking about one stock in particular or you know, what a particular drop means or what's the best strategy to use in, in like a certain uh, case like that. Um, and then we also have investment analysis. Now, if you go with the yearly membership, you have full access to investment analysis and we do 12 a year. Uh, plus you have access to all of our back analysis. So you can really um, pick my brain in detail looking at how I've assessed stocks in the past. Um, one of the huge advantages of signing up uh, versus another site is that you, can, you also have direct access to me. So I help a lot of investors implement their investment strategy. Okay. Um, so yeah, those are the main advantages. Yeah, great, great. Um, do you do this full time? This running the yeah, Hidden Hunter? Yeah, I do actually. Um, most of my time, uh, actually these days, we're going through, as you know, we're going through a major website overhaul. So we're upgrading uh, the member section quite a bit to bring a lot of additional value to members. Um, so a lot of my time is spent uh, planning and coordinating that. Um, plus writing research, doing research analysis, um, writing articles. Uh, I also obviously manage my own portfolio and I've started an investment partnership just recently, uh, not open to the public. Okay. But so that pretty much takes up all of my time. Um, when I first started NetNet Hunter, I was actually working full time and I was putting the site together after hours. Wow. So home from a long day. And, you know, I would just, you know, type away on my computer on the couch and then just ended up crashing at like 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night with the computer on my chest. Um, and then, you know, weekends I was writing articles. But after about a year, it was clear that NetNet Hunter was really taking off. So I decided to quit the job 
and just focus full time on this. Uh, it's definitely worth it, right? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Initially, right? Let me guess. Yeah. So, um, who should subscribe to the Nenet Hunter? Is someone who's probably uh, interested to invest uh, using the Benjamin Graham way and doesn't know how to go about it, um, or he or she may not have the time to do it, or he or she is just plain lazy, right? So we need a lot of uh, resources that are being prepared for them to just uh, make decisions. And this membership is where it comes in. Is that the sort of um, target audience that, that you're looking for? Yeah, I think that hits the mark. I mean, um, right now we're set up for uh, to help deep value investors um, shorten their research time. So uh, we really want to help people who want to do their own research and but just don't have the time to maybe do as much research or as much um, stock selection as they would want to. Um, we spend roughly 16 hours every single month whittling through the list, coming out with uh, the best possible stocks. Um, and then all the analysis on top of it that we do uh, really helps people speed up their their research. Now, I would say that um, those are probably uh, the number one people that, or the number one type of people that should be signing up for Net and Hunter. But uh, I want to stop here and, and just um, make it clear two types of people that should not definitely use net net stocks. Uh, the first would be people who are managing more than $10 million uh, US. But I know that's you. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> you're a rich guy. No, no. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're managing more than $10 million US, then uh, this strategy is probably not for you. These companies are tiny. Um, they're not small cap, they're nano cap and micro cap. Um, they're often also illiquid. Uh, so if you have a lot of money to put, put to work, and I define a lot of money by being you know, over 10 million US, then this strategy is definitely not for you. You probably can't make it work. Um, another type of people that should not be using this strategy are people that do not have a strong temperament or uh, are really lacking in emotional intelligence. Because again, you're buying into a company that's just been devastated by a major business problem. Um, you're buying into uh, a company that's been hammered by the crowd, so you're working against the crowd, plus their nano cap and micro cap stocks, and most people don't want to buy those anyways. So you really have to have a strong emotional temperament in order to be able to use this strategy. Now luckily, those two limiting factors screen out a lot of people. So if you're somebody who has a very strong emotional intelligence, very strong temperament, and you're managing, say, I don't know, five million or less, <laughs> then, um, then you have a definite competitive advantage um, over most other people in the marketplace. Um, we didn't really talk about the returns on offer, but uh, if you read the studies, it's very, very, um, the studies very consistently show that this strategy beats the market by roughly 10 to 15% per year on average. Um, so that would work out to roughly a 20 to 25 percent uh, cumulative annual return on average, um, which you know sounds far fetched. I'm going to totally admit that it sounds far fetched because you just don't hear those type of numbers in finance. But um, the only reason that those numbers are available still after something like a hundred years of back testing and people like Graham and, and Schloss uh, using the strategy is because the big players can't get into it. Anybody with more than $10 million just can't use the strategy. Um, as well, you know, a lot of people just aren't cut out to buy net nets because they don't have the emotional temperament. They can't uh, imagine buying anything besides uh, a Warren Buffett moat type stock, you know, that, you know, like a Coca-Cola or, or an Apple. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I actually read your article where you talk about uh, why did Warren Buffett eventually switch his strategy towards a more you know, Philly Fisher kind of uh, style. Uh, it was because he realized that his investment uh, capital has grown so much that he couldn't hunt for this uh, net net stocks anymore because he would ev eventually be pushing up the price, right? So um, 
you heard it all the all the viewers heard, heard it right that uh, what Evan has just said so if you are not Warren Buffett um, if you don't have so much money more than 10 million dollars and you have the temperament uh, to handle uh, volatility handle uh, stocks that are ugly stocks that have problems but they offers a lot of potential because of the huge margin of safety you should head on to uh, netnethunter.com to sign up for a subscription all right so it's net net dot com right okay great so uh thank you evan for the wonderful interview i i'm glad that uh we we were able to pick your brains uh on the net, net investing strategy and i think the viewers will benefit a lot from this interview all right so yeah, thank so you evan not a problem i hope we uh, can do it again sometime all right okay great cheers all right bye-bye <laughs>